hatten im Vorfeld ein bisschen überlegt, dass wir mit ein paar Fragen anfangen, weil eines der Geheimnisse, wie kommt man darauf, einen alternativen Nobelpreis in die Welt zu bringen, wo es ein Nobelkomitee gibt, das furchtbar viel Geld hat, mit Dynamit hat man viel Geld verdient, und dann kommt jemand und sagt, wir machen das alternativ. Und ich habe verstanden, Sie sind selber zum Nobelkomitee gegangen und haben gesagt, ihr müsst Ökologie aufnehmen und die haben das abgelehnt. Ja, also zu Zeiten Alfred Nobels gab es ja die ökologische Frage nicht. Und die, der Nobelpreis hätte ja nur für Preis, man hätte nur Preise vergeben können für Themen, die Alfred Nobel vorgeschrieben hat. Aber die haben eben diesen Riesenfehler gemacht, die haben ja in den späten 60er Jahren einen Nobelpreis, einen sogenannten Nobelpreis für Ökonomie eingeführt, für Wirtschaftswissenschaften. Und da haben natürlich viele gesagt, wenn schon neue Nobelpreise, warum denn nicht auch für Ökologie, für menschliche Entwicklung, für andere Themen. Und äh, die haben aber dann gesagt, nein, nein, also die hatten wohl dann Angst, dass da zu viele Vorschläge kommen. Und äh, es gab auch Mitglieder, es gibt auch Mitglieder der Familie Nobel, die also wütend sind über den Ökonomiepreis. Die meinen, der gehört gar nicht dazu, das ist kein echter Nobelpreis. Und die Nobelstiftung war wohl etwas eingeschüchtert, haben gesagt, nein, danke. Und dann habe ich dann natürlich inzwischen so viele positive Reaktionen bekommen von Menschen, die sagen, das wäre eine tolle Idee. Ich dachte, dann musst du es dann selbst versuchen und sehen, wie lange dein Geld reicht und sehe, wie die Resonanz ist. Und am ersten Jahr war dann die, gab es eine Diskussion auf der Redaktionskonferenz der größten, so seriösen schwedischen Tageszeitung, ob das, das war ja noch zur Zeit des Kalten Krieges, ob das ein CIA-Komplott wäre oder ein KGB-Komplott, um den Nobelpreis zu diskreditieren. Und im zweiten Jahr war ich dann ein etwas so verrückter Einzelgänger und im dritten Jahr kam dann eine Abgeordnete zu mir und sagte, dieser Preis ist so wichtig, der müsste eigentlich im Parlament verliehen werden. Und im fünften Jahr hatten wir das dann erreicht. Und dann kamen auch die ersten Spenden und der Preis war dann gesichert. Und äh, erst in diesem Jahr wendet sich die Situation und wir haben jetzt, äh, der, der, der jetzige Parlamentspräsident will also den Preis nicht mehr im schwedischen Parlament haben. Zur allgemeinen Empörung, wahrscheinlich, höchstwahrscheinlich, weil ihm die Preisverleihung an ähm, Mr. Snowden vor zwei Jahren nicht gefiel. Ne? Jakob von Uxkühl, Sie Das Spannende ist ja immer ganz der Anfang. Und ich habe verstanden, Sie haben diesen alternativen Nobelpreis am Anfang aus Ihrem Briefmarkenhandel finanziert. Ja, das war die einzige Geldquelle, die ich hatte. Ich mit, also mit neun Jahren fing ich an zu sammeln. Mein Vater, der Pazifist war, hat meine Spielzeugpistolen gegen eine Briefmarkensammlung eingetauscht. Und mit, äh, mit elf bin ich dann, sind wir dann von Schweden nach Hamburg gezogen und da merkte ich natürlich dann ein gewisses Preisgefälle. Nicht? Schwedische äh, Marken waren in Schweden beliebter und daher, daher teurer und bei deutschen Marken war es umgekehrt. Da habe ich dann angefangen zu handeln und äh, später dann gemerkt, ich wollte Journalist werden wie mein Vater, aber die, die Zeitungen, für die er schrieb, die waren alle in Geldnöten. Da habe ich gesagt, vielleicht drehst du das dann um und schreibst weiterhin als dein Hobby, aber dein Hobby, die Briefmarken, mit denen verdienst du deinen Lebensunterhalt. Und da hatte ich dann also als ich Anfang 30 war, hatte ich dann genug zusammen, um eben mir überlegen zu können, dass ich also diesen, diesen Preis, wir sagen, natürlich ist er viel kleiner als der äh, Nobelpreis, nicht? der Handel mit Briefmarken wird nie so profitabel sein wie die Erfindung von Dynamit, aber es war eben genug da, damit dieser Preis eine gewisse Aufmerksamkeit erreicht, die, die ja dann, äh, dann stieg. Also Sie können natürlich mit, auch mit dem Preisgeld, können Sie äh, in äh, Arme Länder, viele Reichen, aber wichtiger wurde dann einige Zeit, also der, ähm, der Schutz, den der Preis gab, also den Status eröffnete Türen auch zu anderen ähm, Geld geben, muss man sagen, weil unser Preis, der ist zwar für die Arbeit, aber wir sagen nicht genau, Sie müssen jetzt genau einen Antrag stellen und Sie können nur das und das tun und das sagte uns eine Gruppe in, in, in Afrika, die auch andere äh, Gelder bekam von Regierungen, die sagten, aber mit dem Preisgeld können wir so viele kleine Lücken schließen und das, deswegen ist er so, so effektiv. Aber die Hauptsache ist, wie gesagt, dass Sie mit einem Preis, sonst lohnt es sich ja gar nicht, Sie können den Leuten einen Scheck im Brief schicken, also wenn Sie einen Preis, wenn der nicht ein, ein nötiges Renommee, einen Status hat, der noch wichtig ist, ist das Geld, dann, weil das ist ja viel Arbeit mit verbunden, äh, ist es besser, wie gesagt, man spendet direkt, aber wenn man diesen, und heute gibt es sehr viele Preise, es wäre heute viel schwieriger, wir haben ja durch diese Anlehnung an den Nobelpreis, kein Anti-Nobelpreis, aber doch ein Preis, der eine Herausforderung, der sagte, 
Es gibt heute in vielen Gebieten keine Nobelpreise. Nobel wollte diejenigen unterstützen, ehren, die fördern, die, der, wie er schrieb, der Menschheit den größten Nutzen gebracht hat. Und da fragen Sie sich natürlich heute, was bringt der Menschheit den größten Nutzen? Eine neue technische Erfindung oder ein Pionier der, der Umweltbewegung in Brasilien zum Beispiel, den wir ausgezeichnet haben. Und dann haben Sie die Situation, wo der Preis dann wirklich ähm, Schutz gibt und Türen öffnet. Also ein Preisträger aus Paraguay hat die Rückkehr des Diktators verhindern können, weil er durch den Preis in Paraguay so bekannt war, dass er glaubhaft verkünden könnte, wenn General Schröster seine Rückkehrpläne nicht aufgibt, dann wird er dafür sorgen, dass er im Gefängnis landet. Diese Idee des Alternativen kommt ja jetzt wieder, wenn ich Sie richtig verstanden habe, Sie denken über eine Alternative nach zum Economic Forum in Davos. Naja, also, das ist sicherlich viel zu hoch gegriffen, wir haben den Weltzukunftsrat gegründet, weil, und ich meine, irgendwie komplementiert das sicher auch, also in Davos treffen sich ja die, die Unternehmer und man redet sehr viel darüber, was nun also geschehen sollte, das ist nicht nur bei den dort so, wo man hin möchte, was alles falsch ist, was richtig gemacht werden könnte, aber die harte Arbeit ist ja, wie komme ich von hier bis dort? Und das ist also was, der Weltzukunftsrat arbeitet in erster Linie mit, mit Policymakers, also mit Parlamentariern und mit Bürgermeistern, muss man sagen. Also Bürgermeister ist ein äh, underutilized resource, die haben oft also viel mehr Glaubwürdigkeit als andere Politiker und können also in Städten viel bewegen und die meisten Menschen in der Welt leben ja inzwischen in Städten. Und das heißt, wir schauen, wo, in welcher Region, Stadt, in welchem Land gibt es schon ein wirklich gutes, wirksames Gesetz. Wir beprüfen dieses Gesetz nach Kriterien, die die internationale Staatengemeinschaft schon angenommen hat, in Johannesburg 2002, Criteria for Principles of Future Just Lawmaking, und ähm, dann helfen wir dann diese Gesetze in andere Länder zu verbreiten und dort anzupassen. Das ist also sehr aufwendig und wir könnten das bei weitem nicht so viel tun, äh, wie wir wollen. Äh, und deswegen haben wir, wo wir auf Gebieten, wo wir auch nicht die Ressourcen haben, das zu tun, da haben wir aber diese ganzen besten Gesetze gesammelt in einem globalen Politikaktionsplan, Global Policy Action Plan. Äh, die hat eine eigene Website, futurepolicy.org und die, die laufend aktualisiert wird, wo alle, die interessiert sind, aber natürlich auch Parlamentarier, sich informieren können, wo gibt es irgendwie schon ein gutes Gesetz und die können dann, wir wollen das, diese Website jetzt so interaktiv machen und, ähm, also, ähm, und auch mehrsprachig, sodass äh, die sich dann auch unterhalten können in ihrer eigenen Sprache, wie funktioniert denn dieses Gesetz bei euch und was funktioniert nicht und wie kann ich das bei mir einführen. Sich einsetzen, selber machen, nicht warten, dass es die anderen tun, und in Alternativen denken. Herr von Uxkühl, Sie haben das Wort. Danke. So, I was asked to speak in, in English this morning about right livelihood and entrepreneurship. I want to begin with a quote from um, Winston Churchill, which I think is very timely again. He wrote in 1936, owing to past neglect in the face of the plainest warnings, we have entered upon a period of danger. The era of procrastination, of half measures, of expediences and delays is coming to a close. In its place, we are entering a period of, a period of consequences. And I think today the most shocking news is the speed at which we are depleting the resources of our planet. Ivan McFadden twice raced a yacht from Melbourne to Japan. The first time, about 10 years ago, he regularly saw turtles, dolphins, and flurries of feeding birds. But this time, he said, for 3,000 nautical miles, there was nothing alive to be seen. Would we have wanted previous generations to treat our planetary home in this way? Our ancestors sometimes saw themselves living in historically important times of change and transition. This gave their own lives a sense of heightened importance, even if those who followed them did not share their perception. But today there can be no doubt that we live at a crucial time in human history. Our decisions and actions, or our failures to act, will have an impact on future generations for centuries, possibly for millennia or even geological time periods. 
This, of course, is an enormous responsibility which we cannot escape. It's the result of decisions taken first out of ignorance, but over the last decades knowingly, to bet the future of human civilization on the belief that economic growth, markets and technologies will always find solutions to the problems they have created. In his overview of failed civilizations, Jared Diamond notes that the most frequent cause of their collapse was their holding on for too long to outdated belief systems which had once served them well, indeed provided the foundations for their success. Over the last century, Western Europe and North America developed a new belief system and political ideology, economic growth, which not surprisingly conquered the world as it promised an earthly paradise for all. Warnings of natural limits were ridiculed and evaded until now by growing into the ecological and economic space of other countries, what we call globalization. To silence the skeptics and justify the wealth accumulation, mostly of a small minority, economic growth has to constantly accelerate at the expense of our planet's health. Today, every living system is declining and the rate of decline is accelerating. Important rules like don't poison the water, which was a capital crime for our ancestors, or the soil or the air, are broken regularly. So today, if you look at the science and they're not pessimistic, you have not really understood the data. But while the challenges we face are unprecedented, history offers many examples of people overcoming seemingly impossible odds. Slavery abolitionists were the first to create an international movement to defend the rights of those they did not know. At that time, three out of four people in the world were enslaved. Enslaving each other was what human beings had done for ages. Abolitionists were ridiculed and told they would ruin the economy. But within a few decades, their moral crusade succeeded in delegitimizing slavery. In 1941, Winston Churchill told US President Roosevelt that he had no defense against a Nazi invasion and urgently needed planes and ships in huge numbers. Roosevelt called in the leaders of US industry who said his demands were impossible. Roosevelt then enacted the Selective Service Act, allowing him to take over uncooperative factories and the industrialists quickly changed course. By 1943, a plane was produced every four minutes, a tank every seven minutes, and two seagoing ships every day. Roosevelt biographer Doris Kearns Goodwin writes, ironically, while the leaders of industry clung to a static view of the American economy, it was Roosevelt and his so-called impractical theorists who held the powerful vision of the country's potential to produce more than anyone had ever dreamt possible. Visionary leaders expand the limits of possibility. But where are those leaders today capable to inspire and motivate us to heed the increasingly desperate warnings of the scientific community by confronting the very inconvenient truth that current policies are leading not to a global paradise but to the collapse of human civilization, possibly of life on Earth? After the financial crash, the British Prime Minister at the time, Gordon Brown, wrote, I believe the most stunning revelation of the crisis was this. The ethical values that matter in everyday life had never infused the financial market. Banks, he discovered, had spent savers' deposits without their knowledge. He was furious, he wrote, to discover this. We were misled, he wrote. Frankly, I was stunned to learn that the leader of a major G7 economy and longtime chancellor of the Exchequer did not know how our financial system works. That ever-increasing consumption is an imperative worldwide is the basic belief system of our political leaders. When told that this may no longer be physically possible, they are lost. In Japan, the young Satori generation are increasingly anti-consumerist. The number with driving licenses is going down, etc. There are many signs of this, and it drives the economists and politicians to despair accusing the young Japanese of destroying growth by refusing to buy. 
In the USA, under the pressure from mining companies, in 1995, Congress stopped the Bureau of Economic Analysis from working on reforming GDP to take environmental costs into account. And 10 years ago, China suppressed green GDP data, which would show economic growth to have been far lower than previously claimed. So lots of the successes we've been told about in recent years, the so-called growth disappears if, we actually, if you actually include the costs. Climate change is, of course, the defining issue of our time and the greatest challenge you will face wherever you live for the coming years, for there can be no jobs, no security, and no development or markets on a dead planet. And it was fascinating to hear recently the head of the International Trade Union Federation, Sharon Barrow, make a very similar comment when asked why in her speech she hadn't spoken about jobs, but just about the climate. She said, there are no jobs on a dead planet. Climate change, of course, long before will create a huge refugee crisis for which we are neither politically nor morally prepared. In Bangladesh, 50,000 people will migrate to the capital every month because rising sea levels have made their villages, their villages uninhabitable and destroyed their arable land. The former head of the IMF, Michel Camdesou, expects 200 million African climate refugees to try to reach Europe in the next 20 years because they can no longer survive at home. And whatever methods the EU tries to use to stop them, enough will arrive to make Europeans, to make European countries increasingly ungovernable. I mean, as we see, already a few million war refugees is threatening the cohesion in Europe. And of course, what can be done, massive things can, can be done. The renewable energy revolution in the global south, in Africa, and agroforestry, you can create jobs now, you can uh, harness this renewable energy, which we are wasting, because every day of sunshine, if we don't tap it today, the sunshine of today can no longer be used tomorrow. And there is, of course, more than enough sunshine there. There's just a lack of coordination and political will, apart from in a few countries. Rwanda, for example, has a new massive solar PV installation, which was uh, conceived, designed, installed, and, and took into, you know, took, came into production within less than a year. So the idea that this, everything has to move very slowly is also not, is not true, even in Africa. In many ways, of course, we don't know what a sustainable future would like, as with the right policy incentives and a new era of innovation, discovery, investment, and enterprise will present still unimagined and exciting opportunities once we break free from our self-imposed limitations. The challenge we face is comparable to the end of the Middle Ages when church power based on religious dogmas stopped progress. And just like the debates about those dogmas could only be held in Latin, so if you didn't speak Latin, you couldn't participate. In today's world ruled by money, debates are limited by financial dogmas and expected to be held within their parameters. So the most important message I always give is learn how money, how the financial system, especially how money operates. And the World Future Council has produced a number of uh, studies on this, which you can see, for example, as I just mentioned, the costs of not using renewable energy. We've calculated it several billion or US trillion dollars a year, which is wasted. And you know, this is a methodology which is used by the coal industry, for example. If you close down a coal plant for environmental reasons, they say, oh, this could still have run for 30 years. You have destroyed so many millions of industrial capital, but, and you know, wasted it. But we are daily wasting you know, huge sums of natural capital by not maximizing, tapping the maximum you know, wind, solar, and other renewable energies. So far, many reform proposals, as you know, are, off, are often blocked by the claim that they would cost too much, suggesting that maybe we can't even afford to live on this planet anymore. You know? In reality, of course, whatever we can do, whatever a society has the resources, the labor, the knowledge to do, we can also finance. Anything else is, of course, nonsense. Money is something which you know, we can create. And creating new money against new performance that is for producing new goods and services with unused productive capacities with unemployed labor is not inflationary. Again, a very important point to take forward because whenever they tell you about Weimar and Zimbabwe, you point out that this has nothing to do with it. In Weimar, as we know, production went down because of the war, because of the occupation of the Rhineland, 
and the government kept printing money. So of course there was too much money, of course there was mass inflation. In Zimbabwe, they, they quickly you know, you know, Africanized the main export industry, tobacco, and the new owners were not, didn't have the skills, so production went down, exports went down, government print mo printed money, you had mass inflation. But if you print money to, to fund new production, new uses of underutilized resources, as I said, to produce goods and services, it's not inflationary. And instead of wasting money with so-called quantitative easing and pumping it into the banking system, or now, <coughs> pardon, they talk about so-called helicopter money, I just spreading it among the people, which <coughs> either will lead to them thinking the system is really uh, going down the drain and they're going to save even more, not spend it, or they're just going to spend it in whatever way and, you know, which as we know, many times of consumption the climate can't afford. So instead, of course, this new money should be used, the central banks should create new money to fund new investments in the transition, in renewable energy, in agroforestry, in Africa, in the global south, but, you know, also here there's much which could be done and we have done a number of studies on this, some which we have presented how the the various development banks, or the Green Climate Fund, can issue bonds, perpetual bonds, even <coughs> zero interest bonds, and the central banks can buy these up and put them in the reserves. And as you know, debts of the central banks don't have to be repaid. This is a privilege of central banks. So you could move very, very quickly and produce, you know, start a massive, <coughs> speedy investment in the transition with new central bank money. And we have now got the the central banks actually discussing this, but it needs much more pressure, and I think especially, you know, from the, the business community to say, this is what we now need. And there are various, you know, methodologies how this could be done. We started looking at special drawing rights of the IMF, <coughs> but of funding these new investments. We then, by the time we got to the Paris uh, climate meeting, we concluded that it's, it's uh, the, the main problem, as you know, why many of these investments don't happen, is that uh, because there's no level playing field, because of the massive subsidies of um, fossil fuels, they are not yet profitable. And they're also seen as risky. So um, uh, the banking financial system asks for ridiculous interest. The, the, uh, St. Vincent in the Caribbean, the energy minister, told me they had a very well-costed solar, solar plant and the, the banks were asking him for you know, 23, 24% interest. So that's why, but you don't have to then take over 100%. You can basically say, okay, if 70% was funded by new central bank money, or 30% even, would the private sector, you know, find it interesting to do the other 70%? So you can combine this in, in very new and innovative ways. And we, you know, we're looking into that. We will really will like also want to a dialogue with, you know, business on this. Because so far, you know, business and civil society shy away. They think money is something technical and, and neutral and, you know, don't upset the, the system. In fact, this is, uh, you know, a very clever way of the, the banking sector to keep its power, its monopoly on, on creating money, which as we know has led us to many of the problems, you know, we are, we're now facing. So, if we could swiftly, as we did, create trillions to save the banking system, we can, of course, create whatever we need to stabilize the climate and protect our natural environment on which life on Earth, including economies and markets, depends. And, of course, you know, provide, an em provide employment for those who are, would like to be part of this and can't find the jobs. The consequences, and this, I think, is also key, of financial debts can always be dealt with, they can be overcome, they can be postponed, they can even be repu repudiated. There have been many examples of this in, in, in the past and, you know, after at least, at most a few decades, it has been overcome, the consequence of any financial collapse. But the nature, of course, provides no rescue packages and you cannot negotiate with the climate, you can't negotiate with melting glaciers or spreading deserts. So today, the greatest single threat to our shared global future are economists who don't understand these natural limits and risk hierarchies, but whose advice is still taken seriously by political leaders. So you have a man called Lawrence Summers who had probably four most important, powerful positions in the world. He was chief economic advisor to two American presidents, Clinton and Obama. He was um, chief economist of the World Bank and he was president of Harvard University. And he wrote a paper in which that our natural environment was presented as a subsystem of the human economy, a box within a box. 
And our alternative Nobel Prize winner, Professor Herman Daly, said to him, well, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. You know, the economy is clearly a completely dependent subsystem of our natural environment. And, you know, Summers refused to change this diagram. And um, if you consider this, it's not just you disagree with him. It's not just wrong. It's mad. It's on the level to believe that the Earth is flat. But somebody who believes, literally, you know, that the Earth is flat, that the nature is a subsystem of the human economy, is the main economic advisor, has been the main economic advisor to two U.S. presidents, has chaired the most prestigious university, you know, and, as I said, been chief economist of the World Bank. These economists and their, the politicians, they, they advise worship markets, but markets are good servants, of course, but they are bad masters, and, of course, they're an even worse religion. The claim that markets can be self-regulating and are superior to the state is ideological and, you know, is nonsense. To quote the sociologist of capitalism, Karl Polanyi, the road to the free market was opened and kept open by an enormous increase in continuous, centrally organized and controlled interventionism. And, you know, sometimes on a, on a panel with these businessmen, uh, usually of a certain age, she'll sort of lean back and say, well, you know, the less state we have, the better, you know, the state is inhibiting us, you know, we, if just, you just let us, you know, just let the market do it. I said, oh, you must be investing a lot in Somalia then, because, of course, you have no state whatsoever to worry about, there's no government. And they look a bit embarrassed, because, of course, no sane businessman would invest in Somalia, unless you have, you know, a lot of bodyguards and run your own mafia there, you know. Recent Technological revolutions were often made possible by state support and regulation. And when regulations are weakened by strong lobbies, costly crises are likely. In 2000 to 2002, the German and, and some other governments we researched were persuaded by the financial industry to make pure bets on future prices. I, you know, as opposed, you know, not talking about the farmer hedging his harvest next year, not talking about the real economy hedging, we're talking about just pure bets on future prices, um, used to be classified as gambling. And, you know, therefore those contracts were not legally enforceable. Just like uh, many countries, if you go in a casino and you lose money and you pay with a check and the check bounces, it's not legally enforceable. And this used to be the same for this, this was classified, as I said, as gambling, but they persuaded the German government to turn it into legally enforceable contracts. And this was a major cause of the financial crisis. Immediately, a number of American bankers saw an opportunity to sell these uh, very complex um, products to uh, usually German local authorities, for example. And of course, the contracts were enforceable and many of them are still struggling to repay and it's, you know, being sued, etc. This little known fact was researched and published by the World Future Council Finance, uh, Future Finance team, and you will find the study on our our website. Economists discounting the future discriminate by date of birth and make protecting future wealth uneconomic. If you look at the discount rates currently being used and you extrapolate that, you know, I think 200 years into the future somebody will worked out that the whole planet is then worth as much as an apartment today. You know, it's the discounting practice has been attacked by Nicholas Stern, who was, of course, chief economist of the World Bank, because uh, he said it's, it's based on the, and, and um, also Pavan Sukdev, who came from Deutsche Bank to UNEP and is now a member of the World Future Council. Uh, he says um, it's based on the assumption that whatever happens, we'll all be richer in the future. But if we actually are becoming poorer because we can't stop, you know, climate chaos, etc., cetera, um, discount rate should be negative which would, of course, totally transform our economic planning and priorities. I haven't actually seen yet one study which has calculated the consequences. It would be enormous. The famous economic bottom line, of course, always depends on what we include in and exclude from the top of the line. Externalizing production costs is not only unfair competition, but it's really fraud, you know, and fraud especially against or theft from future generations and should be dealt with as such. As the English social critic John Ruskin wrote 150 years ago, private enterprise should never be interfered with, but on the contrary, much encouraged, so long as it is indeed enterprise involving the exercise of individual ingenuity and audacity in new fields. But private enterprise that poisons its neighborhood or speculates through individual gain for common risk is very sharply to be interfered with." End of quote. 
Today we have allowed the second kind of enterprise to become so powerful that forcing corporations to pay the full costs of their production would bankrupt most of them. Pavan Sukhdev writes about this in his book Corporation 2020. And curiously enough, the ones who would survive are the luxury brands. Because you know the brand extra luxury brand value by itself does not create extra CO2 emissions. And Johann Seitz from Puma said a few years ago, you know, that he'd calculated that if they internalized all the production costs, which would be very difficult because 92% of them would were in the supply chain, but if they actually managed to do this, their profits would go down by 75%. And I said to him, well, you're extremely lucky because you'd still be profitable. Most other uh, companies would not be. And the tourism industry is an example. There is a, one of these sort of luxury tourism brands who has a, holds conferences um, in the Maldives on their island and they invited me the ones they didn't invite me back uh, because I told them what was probably quite an inconvenient truth because they said we are setting an example. I said no, you're not setting an example to the wider tourism industry because if somebody uh, comes to you and they pay whatever a thousand euros, 1500 euros a night and you add 150 euros to that to make it you know, sustainable, you have permaculture, you have all the sort of natural uh, systems, uh, everything is sort of, you know, recycled and the air conditioning is all very natural, etc. Um, you know, you can do that. But I said the mass tourism, even the four-star tourism, um, a hotel owner in the Canaries told me that the, uh, the travel agents, uh, the travel companies pay him 60 euros a night for full board. Now, he can't add the 150 euros to make it sustainable. So, this is the real challenge we face. Now, when I mentioned this to the woman who ran the tourism department at the World Economic Forum, she said, oh, well, of course, the, the age of mass everything is over. I said, well, you better tell this to the Chinese and to the, you know, uh, to the Indians. So there is an attempt to escape, you know, this, this natural scientist call it, the fa they have something they call the fallacy of the successful first step. You know, come and say, look, you know, we have transit to sustainability, but uh, to replicate this on a world level is a completely different challenge. One very interesting uh, aspect in this debate is how we are no longer treated as citizens, you know, only as consumers, although the priorities of both can be very different. And there is a wonderful story here where um, an American professor of economics heard an application that the Disney Corporation had asked to build a Disney park inside an American national park near the, near the city. And so he asked his students if they would visit such a park. And of course, the vast majority would. The consumer interest was clearly there. He then asked if they thought the US government should allow it to be built. An overwhelming majority was strongly opposed, arguing that the government had a duty to future generations to preserve the natural parks still left intact. But you know, this second question is hardly ever asked. People are asked as consumers, and then they say, oh, well, people have answered. You know, this is the majority have said this and this. They are never asked the second question, you know, how they feel about it as citizens. Advertising has now sort of built a culture of constant dissatisfaction and discontent, leading, leaving Western adults on the emotional level of insecure teenagers who have been able to borrow their parents' credit card. You know. This has not been a natural development, but has been the result of a deliberate strategy, as described by the American marketing pioneer Paul Masur, who writes, who wrote, we must shift America from a needs to a desire culture. People must be trained to desire to want new things, even before the old ones have been entirely consumed. Al Gore quotes this in his latest book. As a result, Americans today buy twice as many items of clothing as they did only 20 years ago, of course, decades after any wartime scarcity ended. Our governments still believe that the magic of the market will somehow produce the massive eco-industrial transformation which our global production systems now require, sort of, by themselves, even with the current perverse incentives. And this faith in the power of price to dictate results under any circumstances is really to believe, uh, tantamount to belief in myth and magic. Of course, you know, you need to set the right incentives. And that's why I set up the World Future Council, because I found the alternative Nobel Prize, you award best practices, but it's not enough. The best practices cannot survive against in the wrong incentives. You also need the right policy incentives and you need to work with policy makers. You know, this is most important. 
message, get involved in politics, not as lifelong politicians who understand how the political system works, understand how money works, get involved in the local level, on the regional level, on the national level. You know, I mean, I was a member of the European Parliament just for a couple of years, but I understand how the system works. I set up a, a new political party in Sweden during the Bosnian War with some friends of mine just because we are so outraged what was happening there. It's called the Sarajevo List, and it's very interesting in the experience. If once in your life decide to set up a new political party, you will find how the system turns against you and how you're being blocked at every way and, and the kind of limits which exist and difficulties which exist if you, you know, in the so-called so democracies. So the World Future Council, which was set up in 2007, identifies, spreads and adapts the most effective laws and policies from around the world, which can provide the economic and social incentives required to change course. And again, you know, we bridge the gap between policy research, which is often, you know, academic, but ac universities don't dare to get involved. They can't because their statutes get involved directly as policymakers. So we bridge that gap because the policymakers quite often don't have the information and the capacity to actually, you know, change these laws. Government, civil servants don't, don't work with them. They are often captured by, by lobbyists. And we basically work to do what the international community has already said they want to do, but they haven't done it. Like the principles according to which we check these laws, said, you know, were already adopted by the international community in, in 2002. And every, usually there are these sort of breakthrough initiatives, these breakthrough laws somewhere, and policymakers are keen to learn about them, as I said, but, you know, they often don't know how. So we assist them, and, you know, there are many organizations now in the world who work on the why something is wrong, what should be done, where we want to go to, but we focus on how to actually get there. We also make it a plain, we work closely with the United Nations, within the Parliamentary Union, which are, unites all the parliaments in the world. We always present ourselves as an international organization, not as an NGO or as a non-governmental organization. I mean, to me, civil society defining themselves by a negative, you know, you start by saying we are a non-something, is a big mistake. So, this work is, is vital, but it's very difficult. It's difficult also to, to fund. A charitable foundations quite often say, oh, you know, what you're doing is political advocacy. It's not, we can't be afraid to fund this. We might lose our charitable status. But it's crucial. As Martin Luther King once said, laws may not move the heart, but they restrain the heartless. We brought together these, as I mentioned briefly before, the most important breakthrough policies in the Global Policy Action Plan, which you'll find, you find the website futurepolicy.org, and I've got a few copies of the hard copy with me. And um, they show the path to a sustainable civilization. They include the following key areas where policy reforms are now vital. Legalizing debt-free money creation by central banks to fund the eco-industrial revolution, as I mentioned a green tax shift and green budgeting, allowing only financial instruments that serve the real, serve real wealth creation, I know more pure speculation, laws encouraging divestment laws from unethical investments, you know, the divestment campaign, now the uh, stopping investments in the fossil fuel industry had a huge, have had a huge impact. Uh, Handelsblatt wrote last year, you know, the fossil fuel companies are now asking for a carbon price. Don't they realize this is going to be the rope to hang them with? Because once you have a carbon price, of course, the pressure to raise it, to really take care of all the costs, to create a level playing, 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 level playing field is going to be massive. And then, of course, once you have a level playing field, no fossil fuel anymore is, you know, is, is competitive. But this, in order, you know, so you don't think it always takes enormous amounts of time, enormous big coalitions to get something going. This divestment campaign was started through a lunch in Stockholm by two of our award recipients. Bill McKibben, whose organization 350.org, one of the most effective climate campaigns in the world, uh, met with Alan Rusbridger, who was then the editor of The Guardian, which has become the largest online serious news site. And um, The Guardian basically started this campaign, which had this enormous impact. You know, If you look last year, how this, this divestment campaign took off from sort of January when they started it, to uh, you know, just in the first six months. Mandating ecologically intelligent design and production according to the cradle to cradle principles. Legalizing benefit corporations with broader mandates. You trust you know about the benefit corporations started in the US states of Maryland and, and Vermont and now also exist in Chile and a number of other US states where you actually have corporations which are, you know, not charities, they are profit making enterprises, but they don't have the, the legal mandate to maximize the profits. 
They first wanted to call them no, low profit corporations, but that didn't, didn't uh, like that name very much. And then now they're called benefit corporations. And it's, it's fascinating if you look at uh, existing uh, businesses have been turned by their owners into benefit corporations also in a number of cases. Ecological literacy testing in university economics courses and business school agendas. Very important that our economists, that you know, business school graduates understand the real world and have ecological literacy. The US state of Maryland, again, has um, ecological literacy as, as a mandatory subject in secondary schools. And we're now just working to, we have a, next week, we, have a, we gave them the Future Policy Award. We have an award, which is not money, a non-monetary award, which you do together with the UN and with the IPU, for best laws every year with a different theme. And um, last year it was rights of children, and one of the laws was this um, Maryland law, which we're now helping to take to Europe and ecological literacy. We need, of course, sustainable progress indicators for government decision-making, as I mentioned before, when they have been really been introduced, like in the USA and China, they abolish them again because they don't want to hear, you know, what real progress is. The fact that basically the limits to growth uh, advocates were right. So if you look at what happened since the 1970s, you know, growth continued, but quality of life in many countries have stagnated. The environmental um, indicators have gone down. We also need, of course, to abolish uh, fossil fuel subsidies and create a level playing field, as I said, in the energy market. We've been working on this um, proposal for 100%, how to achieve 100% renewable energy. There are some places already they do this, so we take people to see them. There's a small Canary Island called El Hierro, where they have 100% renewable, so we take European parliamentarians to understand it. We take parliamentarians from Tanzania to Bangladesh to understand how the solar home systems there, which are growing rapidly, are, uh, you know, are, are working. And uh, I think this um, is going to be the next huge challenge because it sounds very easy, you know, abolish subsidies, abolish fossil fuel subsidies. But of course, people have got used to them. They, this is their whole lives. When the, the government, and this is more for financial than for climate reasons, in Jordan, they decided to abolish the petrol subsidies. They had huge riots. But the taxi drivers especially, because petrol had been so cheap, and suddenly the income of the taxi drivers had gone down by two-thirds. You had similar problems in riots in Sudan when they did it, in Nigeria. The Indonesian government was more clever. They had a more integrated approach, where they actually said, OK, if the fishermen can't afford to go out so far because petrol has become too expensive, we have to make sure that their smaller catch close to the shore is worth more. So we have to build fish processing factories. But despite this, the new president has had to reintroduce some of the subsidies because they had created so much social unrest for decades. You know, you had uh, people stopped growing food and started growing tobacco because you had this uh, cheap uh, transport. And, you know, it's not very easy to even reverse things which were working one sometimes in, in the past. So as I said, you know, a huge challenge and obviously a huge challenge for entrepreneurs. Yesterday morning, I was asked my host in, in Hamburg, who has a business and investor background, for his suggestions on how best to combine right livelihood and entrepreneurship. And his immediate reaction was that they can't be combined. One is about ethics and the other is about maximizing profits. This is, of course, a sort of rather modern misconception associating business with wrong livelihoods. Our ancestors ran moral markets where and this may not always been so, but there are many examples. The inventors and the traders who wanted access, they arrived, you know, and they wanted access to this market. And they first, the, only the, the, the poor, the old, the widows, etc., were allowed, and they were granted access to them. And then uh, they saw how they treated them. Did they adjust their price levels to what they could afford, even if they took a loss on solid cost? And only if the, if the poor then came back and said, yeah, those traders have treated me fairly, why the traders allowed to stay when the market was open to the general population and they could make their profits. This is just one example that, you know, there is no conflict, basic conflict between morality and markets. But we, of course, have delegated social responsibilities to the state. And no doubt this can be efficient, but it loses its effectiveness and legitimacy when the state is then no longer has the resources or even the will to fulfill this function. The advocates of global markets boasts of productive overall win-win solutions, and this may of course even be true overall, but there are so many losers, and if they are not compensated and looked after, of course they turn against it. And so you now have the fact, I mean, we know about the reaction from the, the right here, the, the globalization losers and Brexit and all that, but I mean, to me, the, 
most fascinating example is that a, a self-proclaimed -pro socialist, Bernie Sanders, uh, became the favored presidential candidates of the younger generation in, in the USA. Right livelihood, i.e. right living, means that every right, including the rights of enterprise, of course, come with duties and responsibilities if they are to retain the legitimacy and the trust required to operate, especially in democratic societies. For with trust, almost everything is possible. Without trust, almost nothing. Right livelihood, as I'm sure many know, is one of the cornerstones of, Buddhist, of, of, of Buddhism, of right living, of the Eightfold Path. And you know, it means living lightly on the earth, basically. I'm not a Buddhist, but I named the award I set up, an award for personal courage and social transformation, the Right Lavrid Award, because Right Lavrid is, is the social capital holding our societies together, whether they are Buddhist or not. Over 40 years ago, the Club of Rome warned of limits to growth if business as usual continued. It has continued, and the crisis it foresaw are now growing, some slower, some like soil erosion, faster than expected. But it's often forgotten that the limits to growth report was soon followed by a second report entitled No Limits to Learning. It highlighted the fact that on the one hand, resources, some many resources are limited, and for example, the German per capita resource consumption is not and will not be possible worldwide, even as Somebody worked out the resource consumption in Taiwan will never be possible per capita in mainland China. You know, you just find lim find meet limits. And of course, there can be no human right to something which isn't possible. But this clearly raises global justice issues. Why is it justified somewhere if it can't be justified everywhere? But as the second report said, there are no limits to the skills, the arts, the languages, etc. we can learn. No limits to personal growth. Once our basic material needs are met, which is possible worldwide still. By widespread popular mobilization, the population of the poor Indian state of Kerala has achieved life quality indicators closer to those of industrialized countries than to the richer parts of India. They just said, we don't need to wait for trickle down growth to educate the people. We just educate them. And you know, they have the indicators instead of um, and, um, reading and skills and you know the um, life expectancy, life expectancy, uh, infant mortality, all those rates are closer to the industrialized world than to the rest of India, although it's one of the poorest parts. So you have a model which works. I call it the trickle up model. And there are many such initiatives and examples of, you know, where of course there are entrepreneurship is embedded in them, in the local communities. You know, localism of course has many, many advantages. The, positive externalities which you have can be benefited, can be enjoyed locally, and the negative externalities you find out so quickly that you, know, you're, you stop them pretty quickly because you can't dump them onto future generations or onto distant, distant people. We are now in unknown territory and we need to think outside the box in many ways. The extent to which that is already happening, you know, even in the business community, was brought home to me again last week when I spoke at the Austrian glass recycling, to the Austrian glass recycling industry. And in their business publication, they had an article by Christian Felber, an Austrian who set up something called Gemeinwohlökonomie, sort of Commonwealth, pioneer of the Commonwealth economy. And he calls for a global environmental constitution. And he argues that just as we all accept having just one vote, we need to accept that our right to consume biological resources is likewise limited. Of course, how that will work in practice is, would be an enormous challenge without having really micro-regulation. But still, you can see where we need to move to. And uh, asked to give an example of life in a sustainable society, one example, Chandra Nair, who advises the Chinese government, who wrote a book called Consumptionomics, which you may find interesting because he shows what resource consumption is possible, what isn't possible worldwide. He set up an institute in Hong Kong called GIFT, the Global Institute for Tomorrow. And when he, he was asked for this ex one example, he said, fewer car races and more dancing competitions. Now, it's sort of interesting because, uh, you know, um, many, I think very few budding entrepreneurs would, who wonder what field to enter might consider setting up dancing schools. But, uh, you know, this might very well be an, a market of the future because clearly 
we need to move away from consuming more resources. We have, you know, as I said, there are limits to growth in some levels, but there are also these enormous areas where there are no limits, you know, to all the skills we can learn, especially, you know, the art and dancing, of course, is, is one of them. So he may well be right. I said to him, uh, when you talk, when you talk like this, you know, does it, um, how, how do people react? Well, in China, people nod, they understand that's what's coming. He said, even in Abu Dhabi, he said, they published my speech in the local paper. But in the USA, they, afterwards, they called me an environmental Taliban. <laughs> so, um, another growing market, of course, will be, in Europe, will be repairs and reconditioning. And it's the, the governing Swedish red-green coalition now just recently reduced um, the tax, the VAT rate, on repairs to encourage this, which is, again, fascinating because it's very different from even some years ago in Sweden, there was a huge apartment block in, in, in Malmö where the tenants had decided they had enough skills to do their own repairs. They weren't going to bring in any outsiders anymore. And they were attacked by the right because they were reducing business opportunities. And they were attacked by the left because they were, you know, destroying jobs. So, the common belief, of course, is that the greatest opportunities are in emerging technologies, but this may be short-sighted because these are also dependent on secure energy supplies. When the UK city of Lancaster was flooded recently, all the so-called smart technologists stopped working very quickly. You know, I mention this because it seems to be a, there is a blind spot in the tech sector to this. The Berlin-based World Future Councillor Professor Kreibig notes that, quote, there is not a single reference to sustainable development in the whole big data and smart data a debate. And I've been told my time is up, so I will skip some, uh, some parts here and, uh, you know, move straight to the, the end. <laughs> but I will... I can, of course, provide you with a written text if you want. Now, to conclude, the German philosopher of hope, Ernst Bloch, once wrote that the the price of human free will is the risk that the great historical moment will encounter too small a human race, one not up to the challenge. And that's, of course, we, up, to each, up to each one of us today to decide whether that is so or not. Because we are now the most powerful generations in human history, the guardians of all future generations of life on Earth. The consequences of our decisions and actions will have longer term effects than ever before. So each one of us has the power to decide if we're going to be part of the problem or part of the solution. And to find our specific role, the advice of Aristotle still holds true. He wrote, where the needs of the world and your passion overlap, there lies your vocation. Thank you very much. Thank you.